understand it, go into it, to examine it, give your heart, your mind, everything that you have to bring down, the way of living this depends on you or not somebody else. Because in this there is no teacher, no pupil, there is no leader, there is no guru, there is no master, no savior. You yourself are the teacher and the pupil, you are the master, you are the guru, you are the leader. You are everything. And to understand is to transform what it is. So I guess Dan has already uh, told you that uh, I'm into more the hardware aspect as far as uh, the different free energy and anti-gravity devices and propulsion systems. And my talk is going to be free energy. It's always been with us. And it really has. Uh, Marco mentioned something about uh, alchemy, uh, coal fusion in the Middle Ages, that's true. I mean, it's been around for a very long time. So we have legends in ancient times, the Atlantean fire crystals, which were probably electrets, which I'm going to cover th about that as well. Uh, unbalanced gravity wheels in the 11th century, uh, that's also something that has been around for a very long time. And it's also being resurrected now. Uh, there are gravity wheels that have been uh, started in operation and evidently that's also a real technology. Cold fusion in the Middle Ages. Uh, this is something that has been called alchemy and alchemy and cold fusion are kind of related to one another. It's a gray area that blends into each other. Phonon resonance. Uh, this is using sound or longitudinal waves, which are basically the, uh, the sound equivalent of light or of a, an electromagnetic wave to produce changes at the nuclear level. When, yes, that is, uh, that is also possible. So, Joe Champion rediscovers phonon resonance in the 20th century, although this had been done in ages past. There's something that's, that was called the lost chord in alchemy. And the lost chord essentially is, uh, it's a blend of sound frequencies that can actually cause nuclear changes to occur. And this is something, for example, there are uh, stories of the alchemist actually putting a violin next to the crucible and just drawing a chord while it's at the correct temperature. And, uh, and the crucible would essentially be something uh, that would be a mer red mercury or something similar to that. And a lot of alchemists had some health problems as a result of that. So <laughs> also, physics tells us that matter is frozen energy. And Marco mentioned something about that as well. Matter is a mix of standing wave patterns. So it's almost as if there's very little difference between the light that's here and the matter that's here. The only difference is that it's not moving. And it's essentially a standing wave. So let's go a little forward. Okay, Bessler wheel in the 18th century. The gravity wheel was rediscovered. Uh, John Keeley in the 19th century. John Keeley was a man that produced, uh, again, using phonon resonance, uh, nuclear changes. He also had some devices that would produce anomalous amounts of energy. And Nikola Tesla in the 19th and 20th century, the most famous of uh, the electrical engineers in recent history, uh, actually started out as a mechanical engineer. He, he actually uh, invented a lot of mechanical things and he transitioned over into electrical engineering. So there are a lot of mechanical analogs in early electrical engineering. Uh, for example, uh, the 
the mechanical ether, that sort of thing. Uh, there are energy patents in the 19th century that were uh, very interesting in the effect that it had many free energy aspects to it. And then there's Clerk Maxwell. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, this is an interesting story, that he had a working unified field theory back in the 19th century. And this essentially combined the electric, magnetic, and gravitational fields at that time. Now, back then, there wasn't much of a talk of anything as far as a strong or weak nuclear force. Uh, the strong nuclear force is most likely a short-range gravity field. And now we get into the cover-up part, because there is a political angle to all of this. Nikola Tesla uh, had a interesting run-in with J.P. Morgan. Uh, there's a story about the Nikola Tesla and the carbon button lamps, and uh, Dan had mentioned something about George Egley earlier with the carbon fusion. It all started with Nikola Tesla. So uh, he basically had this carbon button lamp with a high voltage on it, and he noticed that there were what he called actinic rays coming from it, which were X-rays. He also noticed that there was excess energy coming from the carbon button lamp. So he also noted that there was an odd spectrum coming from it, as if there were other elements that were being converted to and from, most notably, notably a boron line, so that there was carbon converting the boron back to carbon again, doing this ping pong back and forth. So when he realized that was going on, he was trying to promote this as a free energy system. Yeah, it's back. Yeah. Anyway, uh, then there was the story of the, the Nikola Tesla and the, the Pierce Arrow. Uh, Nikola Tesla had a, a car, which was called a Pierce Arrow, with carbon rods in there. No one could understand what the carbon rods were for. It turns out that earlier to doing the, the Pierce Arrow, Nikola Tesla had, and Nikola Tesla was a very utilitarian person. He would only invent things he had an immediate use for. So he invented an open air x ray tube. The x rays were tuned to the nuclei of the carbon. No one really picked up on that one. So he realized that if he induced a, a K shell collapse in the carbon, that the carbon would transition into boron. Didn't take much energy to do that, maybe a thousand electron volts or so. A thousand electron volts to turn carbon into boron. And boron turns back into carbon, and what comes out is over 10 million electron volts of energy. So you have massive amounts of energy from a reversible nuclear reaction. There was a talk that Nikola, actually an argument that Nikola Tesla had with J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan said, well, why can't you be like this Einstein fellow? He learned how to split the atom. At that point, Tesla was extremely aggravated, disturbed, and he said that there is no point in destroying natural elements, that we can obtain all the energy we need from reversible nuclear reactions. He was right. That's another way of doing it. So there are people right now, um, George Egley being one of them, and several others that are working with carbon with this to see if the, the carbon collapse will produce excess energy. And historically it does. So there's a great deal of hope on that. Now, after Nikola Tesla uh, does this demo with the Pierce Arrow, then obviously, J.P. Morgan was very disturbed over this idea that uh, Tesla could produce free energy. I mean, he was thinking of doing this thing in a very big way with Wardenclyffe. So he had two different methods that Tesla knew that he could do, and he knew that these two methods 
were very disastrous to the economy. And these were people that were plugged into the economy in a very big way. They were making profit. And one of the things that Morgan said is if this fellow Tesla gets his way, all we'll be able to do is sell antennas and then they'll be able to milk this cow for free. So he intended to turn off the milk supply. <laughs> so uh, Oliver Heaviside comes along, who was evidently contracted by some financial interest to bury the original theory on, um, on the uh, joining or the unified field theory. So what happened was that in many of the, uh, the universities, this original theory was being taught and many people were realizing that free energy was possible, that you could tap the vacuum. There's incredible amounts of energy. Yes, there's 10 to the 93rd ergs per cubic centimeter. And if we tap just a fraction of that, to give you an idea how much energy is in there, uh, just a fraction of that energy is enough to boil off all the oceans on Earth. So it's, it's something that you have to be very careful with to tap into. But it's possible to do this. So after Oliver Heaviside basically buries Maxwell, he lobotomized the original theory, where he took the, the gravitational side, just sawed it off, threw it away. Nobody would need it. Well, it turns out that the gravitational side is where you get the free energy. So without the unification, then we couldn't combine the two sides of the equation and get free energy. So after that, then Henry Moray comes along and Henry Moray realizes that there was a working theory and he builds a free energy converter. This produced 50,000 watts. It was about, uh, about that big. And the thing was running cold, which meant that this was producing energy that was not conventional. It wasn't nuclear. It wasn't anything else other than tapping the local vacuum. But Nikola Tesla also mentioned that the secret to doing this was in resonance, where you don't extract the energy, you have it in resonance, where it's pulling out and then snapping back again. So it's called reactive power, and reactive power can power real world devices. So Henry Murray's device was also uh, buried for the most part, but there are people who are recreating this one as well and have a working theory. And so there is a groundswell on free energy. And what we're understanding is that there's a, a certain protocol that you have to use with this for safety. And we're also realizing that whenever you tap vacuum energy, and you can tap this using nuclear fission, by the way, but it's in a bad way because with nuclear fission, this can actually extract, it causes a local loss of binding energy. So, and this has been documented, with nuclear fission, what you wind up with is a local sink for binding energy. So this means that matter basically has a case of dry rot. It begins falling apart. We found this an anomalous embrittlement inside of nuclear reactors. So that not only is the, the concrete and the steel going brittle, but people are too. Uh, if there's, a, uh, for example, people are developing embrittlement in collagen and in their bones, osteoporosis. And when they leave the nuclear plant for two weeks, suddenly those symptoms begin going away. So we know that fission is not the way to go because it's, it's changing the basic structure of the vacuum around it. Uh, fusion is the way to go because it's producing an excess of binding energy. So U.S. National Security Act of 1947 comes along. And what this does, essentially, is it puts a further clamp on most of the, the free energy patents. And after this, they route, and this is in the United States, but they reroute all the patents to go through 
the DOD. What this means is that 7,000 patents since 1947 have been, and this is primarily on free energy and propulsion technologies, have been sequestered. So, also governments are discovered to be corporations and uh, many of the governments of this planet and the conflict of interest runs rampant. This is also part of the political aspect. It's, it's all one... You have to approach this holistically. Unless you approach it holistically, you won't find an answer. So that's one of the things that I'm attempting to do. 21st century, the classified inventions are rediscovered. Interesting thing about many of these gag orders is they have a time lock on them. They have a time limit. So many of these gag orders are now, uh, they're expired. So what this means is that people can actually go into the libraries and find these. And they're there. I mean, anyone can do this. Then, as far as the inventor goes, you might kill the inventor, but not the idea. And this gets into Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance. The original inventors produced this pattern, this idea, and it's in the ethers. People are rediscovering this. So no matter how much they try to suppress it, how much they try to classify it, their security leaks are basically security leaks that are happening in the vacuum where people are realizing that these patterns are already there and they're picking up on them. It's amazing how many inventors are rediscovering the same thing all over the planet. For example, I went to a Tesla conference and there, was, there were five inventors that discovered the same thing and if you match the time zones, then they discovered they had the same idea within five minutes of one another. So it's useless to try to suppress this anymore. And I think some people in the upper echelons are beginning to realize this. And in the United States, Homeland Security Act is really an act to harass inventors. Now you know that there's a equivalent acts in Europe as well. However, they're not pursued as aggressively as in the United States. There is an exodus of inventors of friendly countries over here. So, and there are many that have plans for working devices and they want to share them. So, was Ayn Rand right? Do we need a Galt's Gulch? By Galt's Gulch, I mean that uh, there is a friendly place, uh, a safe harbor for these inventors to go to, to develop these. And I think the answer is yes. I mean, if we have a safe place for these inventors to uh, produce what they believe they need to do, which is to share the fruits of their creativity with humanity, then I think that we can actually be actually living in the 21st century as opposed to the possibly the 19th, which is where we really are right now. The technology that we have has been held back that far. I remember I, there was a friend of mine that asked me, where's my hoverboard? You know, from Back to the Future 3. So, that's true. We should have that right now. Anti-gravity technology has been suppressed since the late 1950s. But there again, all the records are there and anyone can look and find them. And then uh, some of these free energy inventors are beginning to be called terrorists. But in a way they are. I mean, they do threaten the, the economy of the, of the planet. But then the economy of the planet is badly upset already. So I don't think it is that much of a problem. Now let's get into the technology. This is a trout turbine. Uh, it's originally invented by a man by the name of Victor Schauberger. And the trout turbine is a way of producing torque 
through an implosive, uh, an, basically an implosive flow of hydraulic fluid. Now you can also have a liquid metal in there and it'll work even better. How much energy? As much as you want. It depends on how much flow you have in there. Also note that on the outside, if you have an input on the outside of this thing, you'll notice that as it moves through these loops, it produces a reverse vortex on the inside. And that's another important point. How this works is a combination of the, the two reversed vortexes and the fluid flow through the loops. You can see it produces a non-compensated torque, a non-compensated force, and that produces the torque. When Victor Schaumburger originally produced his device, it produced so much power that it twisted off the steel shaft. So this produces a great deal of energy. Richard Clem hydraulic engine. Now another thing is I'm going to show you many of the, uh, the common points with this. For example, this can actually be stretched out and it has been into a, a spiral cone. And the cone actually looks a lot, and if you imagine that the buckets are actually uh, the, uh, the seeds of a pine cone, then in three dimensions that's how it would look. Now, let's look at the next one. The Richard Clem hydraulic engine. Again, please take note that it has a spiral geometry. It has an implosive aspect to it. This one is a, it does have a large COP. The story behind the Richard Clem motor is that he produced an engine that had 325 horsepower. It had so much power that it destroyed the clutch. So again, this was just using cooking oil instead of regular motor oil because the, the hydraulic oil, the, the, the motor oil wouldn't actually hold up under the immense strain. And there were shear effects, there were pressure effects, and he had to use the, he had to use actually cooking oil for this one. So uh, you'll see a lot of the, uh, a lot of commonalities with Dan's imploder in this one as well. For example, uh, please note the rim jets on the, the lower. This one is also a, a part of it. It, uh, and this thing produces, a, a, like I said, a great deal of energy. Uh, we're going to be doing a math model on this one. This one did work. It was back in the 70s and we have some interest that will want to replicate this. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, so, soil effect generator. Now this one produces power through unbalanced magnetic fields. What kind of magnetic fields? Fields that move in a vortex arrangement. This one also produced extremely high values of torque. In fact, you can see that on the upper diagram over here, we have, uh, that's the North Pole, that's the South Pole over here. You can see that the way this thing is arranged, there is no way for this thing to have a, a permanent balance to the magnetic field. So that's how it works. Um, control is, on all of these is very problematic. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a very sore point with many of the inventors. They have had devices explode, destroy themselves. Uh, Victor Schauberger has, Searle has, Clem did. So the challenge for this is to produce a system which is controllable. This one is a Carl Schaefer steam generator. Also note the commonality. You have a, another inverse cone. You have fluid flowing to the interior, producing an implosive effect and on the other hand, this one does not produce, uh, it produces a small amount of torque, but this produces steam. And it produces anywhere from 165 to 325 degrees of steam. The first test that it made was 165 degrees C. And if you look this up on one of the steam tables, that means that it will produce steam at about four bar, which is enough to run 
a turbine. And if you can run a turbine, this means that you can run an alternator attached to that turbine and power your home, power uh, your business, or uh, in a larger version, um, power an entire community or city. And again, this is power from implosive cavitation. It's a combination of implosion with cavitation and mechanical resonance. Because now what you're looking for is a mechanical resonance with the liquid. And when you do that, you can extract energy from the vacuum using that method. Then uh, Dan mentioned something about George Egley earlier. And George Egley's carbon fusion system initially had a COP of 2.0. Other elements were found. There is evidence that this is transmutation in greentechinfo.eu. I think it's .eu. Yeah, okay, .eu. He shows that uh, there is a, a chart, and this chart basically shows all the elements that are being produced from the carbon. Uh, Egley says that he's run this for about six weeks, and it's been producing excess energy. As the elements cook into heavier and heavier elements, it's kind of interesting because when you go from hydrogen to helium, there's a little bit of mass energy left over. By a little bit, I mean you're looking at 25 to 50 megawatts per gram. It's, it's less than matter-antimatter fusion, but it, it's quite a bit. That fraction that's left over, and we're talking about, because of the immense energies that we're dealing with, only parts per million of mass to energy being generated, which is a good thing because it would generate a, a bigger meltdown than it already does. But with that amount, you can power real world things without producing pollution. Because if you're going from carbon to the heavier elements, I have done the spreadsheet analysis on this and it will not go to fissionable elements, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, I know that we have an enormous problem with um, burying fission waste or trying to do something with the nuclear waste that we have now. This will not have that problem. On the other hand, what you do wind up with are precious elements. You'll wind up with rare earth elements that have a great financial value to them. You'll also wind up with and Egley did mention this, it does go through gold, it, go, do, it does go through the platinum series. If you stop the reactions when they go there, then you can pull the material out of the reactor and then refine it. So the nuclear waste from a fusion system as opposed to a fission system has a huge financial value to it. And it's clean energy. Uh, it has a reversible case shell collapse, again, uh, what I mentioned with Nikola Tesla, this is taking place here too. And next let's go to the Rossi ECAT nickel fusion system, another clean system, relatively clean. This one has a COP of 6.0. It goes from nickel to copper, which is just one jump in the periodic table. That one jump produces over 25 megawatts per gram of fuel. If you take a look at the entire sequence, which goes on for 19 pages for the Egley system, this thing produces so much energy that it actually exceeds the mass energy of the carbon that was put into it to begin with. And the Rossi system produces, uh, again, clean energy as long as nickel-59 is avoided. There is a way of doing that. Nickel-58 has a reaction chain, which is complicated, but any kind of transmutation has problems, and you just have to account for all of them. Uh, the Defkalian hyperion reactor, this one has a CLP of 20. It also does nickel to copper. Also 25 megawatts or more per gram of fuel. Now to give you an idea, uh, whenever you, you burn petroleum, uh, petrol, gasoline, in your vehicle, there's a few parts per million of energy, mass to energy being generated. And I mean, you're just burning just uh, tremendous amounts of this. 
but when you convert one element into another going up the periodic table, it produces so much energy that you're just generating energy with picograms of fuel at a time. I mean, you're not dealing with kilograms. That's why you can have a, a cartridge with just a few grams of fuel in it, and it'll last six months. Same thing with the Egli system, and same with many of the fusion systems. And of course, this is Rossi's competitor. Uh, if nickel 58 is used, there are reaction byproducts which will include nickel 59, which has a half life of 76,000 years. So that's something to keep track of. Okay, so here's another device. We're going out of fusion now. This is Tom Bearden's energy collector. And Tom Bearden was interested in tapping the vacuum without producing effects that would uh, have a negative effect on the vacuum. So this was originally put out, I believe, in the 1990s. No one had the foggiest idea how to do this. We knew that the collector was some kind of capacitor. We knew that it needed a switching system or some kind of a resonant frequency going into it. But up to this point, nobody really knew what to do with it until now. This is how to implement Bearden's energy collector. So it's an electret. Essentially what you do is you have two back-to-back -back electrets. What this does is it, it's in resonance with the vacuum without actually extracting anything. It basically produces a, um, a vacuum polarization that produces the, uh, the energy coming out of it. Theoretically, this will work. And bench testing is yet to be done, but we believe that this is the best route to go. Then there's the Charles Flynn transformer using magnetics to do the same thing. There are several different magnetic devices. If you go to Patrick J. Kelly's site, uh, there is a book with over 1,000 pages with all the free energy systems in there. He has documented and over 100 pages for magnetics alone. There's over 200 patents that are known to work that are based on magnetics. So the, the trick with this is to do it without discharging the magnets because if you do this and discharge the magnets, then you have to remagnetize and it becomes a conservative system. If you allow the energy flow to run unimpeded and you just divert the energy flow from one side to the other, then you're going to wind up with a condition where the magnets never discharge. And in this case, then you will be able to extract energy from the vacuum through those magnets because the magnets are basically using spin polarizations that are biasing or rather cohering the local vacuum. This is another device. It's the implosion transformer. It uh, unfortunately imploded. So <laughs> uh, the problem is that, yeah, yeah, uh, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a capacitive tape on core. It produces a, a, an implosion around the, the secondary that actually it moves faster than the speed of light. And this is what produces the effect. Also produces such a tremendous mechanical stress around the internal core that it actually collapses into powder. So that's going to have to be re-engineered. The theory is valid again. It's a control issue. There's the Floyd Sweet vacuum triode amplifier. Uh, Sparky Sweet, or Floyd Sweet, produced a device that uh, had, it was using barium ferrite speaker magnets, and this thing had a tremendous energy output. I mean, it had a COP of over 1,000. So you'd put a small amount of energy in, and 
and this thing would be producing an immense amount of energy out. And yes, it did produce energy out of vacuum resonance. That is, you're, you're putting energy in, but you're extracting it, then you're putting energy in, so the net amount remains the same. You're not tinkering with the local binding energy. So, and having the binding energy go up is okay, unless you have a million of these in operation. For example, if you had a planet full of fusion devices in operation, then the local binding energies would start rising significantly. So what we want to do is actually not produce an effect on the vacuum. We don't want to produce an environmental impact, which is positive or negative. We want to just keep it where it is. And that's what the Floyd Suite device did. And that's what the Electret does as well. So, the Robert Alexander patent. This one was banned in the USA. Interesting story behind this one is that the legend of this one is that it was used on board the US, USS Eldridge, which was in the Philadelphia experiment. Not really something you can verify at this point. However, it's a rotating transformer. What it does is it takes the back EMF and feeds it back into the, the front end. So it produces a forward torque on the motor generator side. This forward torque acts like a motor. So you initially start it up and once it's started, as long as there's a load on it, it will continue to operate. Once again, control issue problem. If you short it out, it will overspeed and explode. So it, it has some problems with that. But that's a, a fairly easy engineering problem to handle. Now we're going to be getting into the anti-gravity side. That's, that's more fun. This is something that was wound on the bench. Also note that this thing has a, a configuration like a Celtic knot where it goes like that. So many of the symbols that we have in ancient times of power are actually symbols of power. They're easily either symbols of ancient technology that produces energy or produces propulsion. It just so happens that the Celtic knot, if you wind a hydraulic line around it, will produce a lifting effect. So how much? This one will pr uh, produce on the bench between 5 and 20 percent lift. So th this is another real technology. What do you do with this one? Well, it turns out that the rest of this, this Celtic knot is all parasitic stuff that you want to get rid of. Victor Schauberger told us that the reason that salmon could swim upstream was because of the vascular system inside of the salmon. You look at the loops behind the, the rib bones and you can see that as the fish is moving back and forth, it's pumping that blood, that fluid through it very, very rapidly. If you do a spreadsheet analysis on this one, you'll see why the salmon can actually go upstream, why they can hover in midair. You'll also see that this is the same type of vascular signature that's in bumblebees and some insects. And Victor, Grimet uh, Victor Gr Grbenikov found this as well and actually did quite a bit of work on that. Uh, he had a lifting platform that worked. This is something that would require a Tesla pump uh, to power it. And we have people that are interested in doing that as well. What do you do with this technology? It needs an application. So, with apologies to Star Trek, this is exactly what you can do with it. It produces a, a lifting force that, again, uh, many of these anti-gravity systems produce a kind of a blue glow. Uh, uh, that was one thing I didn't mention about the Schaefer device. It actually produced steam that had a blue glow to it. Uh, any kind of uh, free energy anti-gravity device, instead of producing a, a greenish or a reddish color to it, it has a, a bluish glow to it. So that's another interesting point. 
Now, this is another thing. It's uh, similar to this. Imagine that you have fluid moving in a vortex, in an involute vortex, in a smoke ring like that. What does it do? Well, there's a few things that are going on with this. For example, you have several gyros that are around the torus, like that. This gyroscopic moment produces a propulsion effect in itself. If you torque those vortexes, then it produces an unbalanced force, which either will act upward or downward, depending on which way you point the, the vortex and which way the fluid is flowing. We have an associate that has done the math work on this, and he shows that a 1.6 meter diameter torus with a 4 liter per second flow rate will produce 15 tons of lift. That one has yet to be built as well. Very encouraging though. Uh, his math has been verified. Okay, let's go to the Kosky Frost experiment of 1927, since that one is really interesting. Back in 1927, there were two scientists, Kosky, and well, obviously Kosky and Frost, that did a crystal anti-gravity experiment. What they did was they took a quartz crystal and they piezoelectrically overloaded it. They treated the crystal by broadcasting energy into it. And first the crystal went from clear to translucent and it grew, it expanded on all four axes. After this, then they, they took the crystal and by this time it had the same consistency as styrofoam. It had lowered its density significantly. They placed the crystal into a holder and realized that that's in that part over here. That's a real photograph. So, interesting story about that one is that the photograph was supposedly a hoax. However, it turns out that science and invention was acquired through a hostile takeover and they wanted to print a retraction. The original owners of science and invention wouldn't do that. So they printed the retraction, said the entire story was a hoax, but it turned out that the, the hoax story was the actual hoax. The reason being that the original story of this one, which was published in a radio Umschau in Germany, has been verified. So this one is the real deal, and Jerry Gallimore said so before he passed away. So how much does it produce? Up to 800 times the weight of the crystal. This means that a one kilogram crystal can lift 800 kilograms. The other thing that it produces is some kind of field effect, because we know that when the crystal experiment was redone for charging it, that the, the man who was doing the experiment, who we were, going, who were calling Mr. X, found that it produced a two meter diameter field around it, that when you went through the field, the hair in the back of your hand would stand straight up. So there was some kind of electrostatic effect. And evidently the experimental rig weighed less when the system was energized. So this is producing a field effect as well as a, a lifting effect. Can this possibly neutralize inertia? It could. It could very well do that. And that remains for the next experiment. But this is something which is en engineerable. This is the original Radio Umschau article. April 1927, and you can see that uh, they did this in a lab and let's see, this was in Telefunken. This was actually in uh, Derrydeen, Poland. So, we did it with technology in 1927. We should be able to do this again now. 
If we can't, there's something really wrong. <laughs> so, what happened to the crystal? What happened is that it was shattered internally and recrystallized in a high energy form. Its quantum state was changed. Its energy state is what we call dielectric constant, which means that its, its, its ability to store electrical energy went way, way, way up. A typical quartz crystal has a rating of 1 to 10. This one was close to 1 to 10 million. So it's extremely high. Okay, what are the inventors offering to the world? Unlimited free energy, anti-gravity, personal freedom from corporate control, freedom to create their own future, or our own future, time for growth and education, because when you're not working as much as you have to to pay for expensive fuel costs, expensive electricity costs, expensive transportation costs, now you have much more time to work on yourself. And that means that you can read a book, uh, you can pursue a hobby, uh, you can climb a mountain, do whatever you want to do instead of being yoked uh, to this, this financial treadmill that we have now. That's what free energy and anti-gravity will promise. So it is also a legacy for our children to be proud of because if we take this step, this means that we'll be passing it to them and they'll be thanking us for it. If we pass this up and we're talking about three generations that have gone by since Nikola Tesla. If we pass it up this time, then I think that the civilization has some serious problems to deal with. But if we take the challenge up, we're looking at a civilization that has a chance to go to the stars. And what do the corporate governments offer? Economic slavery, totalitarianism, George Orwell's 1984, a bleak future on a dead world, ultimately extinction. But that's the downside. How do we find the corporate government's agenda? Now research all references to treaties, secret or covert. Remember, we have to, um, this is a chess game. We actually have to be at least two moves in front of the people who want to neutralize this energy and, and this technology. We have to follow the money because we know that uh, there will be people who are financed to destroy any kind of alternative energy, including the conventional forms of solar, wind, geothermal. Already, uh, they're suppressing geothermal. You hardly see that anymore. We need to find a real history for the motives. We think we know what they're doing, but do we really? We need to find out what their real agenda is. We also need to listen to the whistleblowers, because it's those whistleblowers that will tell us what that agenda is. How do we transition to a real civilization? Because what we have right now is not a real civilization. Return the control back to the people. Easier said than done. Uncorporatized government. In many nations, corporations are considered people. They have personhood. They have more rights than actual people do. We need to reverse that. We need to have it set up so that corporations have charters the way they did in the early days, where if a corporation does not serve the public interest, then they are dissolved. We need to make all those running for public office qualify. The way the system operates right now, we have people that have a hunger for power that are pursuing that office and we let them do it. Well, I think we need to 
rethink that. We can't allow this to occur anymore. Uh, we can't allow sociopaths to be in public office. We create a body politic that integrates all beneficial technology into society. This means that we have an, either an agency or a non-government organization that looks at all the technology and then decides whether this has a positive impact on the future. If this were true, we would not have nuclear power today. Uh, we also need to return to a real currency since the, the fiat currency system that we have now is basically set up to enrich the few at the expense of the many. And then there's the politics of energy. I actually have a, a whole other PowerPoint on that one, which actually becomes a little more radical. But who or what are the forces blocking it? Special interest groups, especially with the corporations that are involved in conventional energy systems. Corporate government, and this was asked to me before, why would the governments want to keep conventional energy in place. The reason is that if you can tax an expensive source of energy, then you can have that fraction of money going back into your coffers. So, in fact, that the worst thing you can do is, uh, the worst thing you could possibly do is have a green energy tax, because what this means is that you're going to actually uh, cause an increase on in the, uh, the tax base, which is keeping the system in place. What we need to do is eliminate the taxes on the energy completely. Because this is what's keeping the system in place. Uh, another problem is corporations with a vested interest in old technology. And these are the ones that are that are hand in hand with the government. And many governments on the planet are set up like this. The banking interests are threatened by a new real economy. By real economy, that means actual goods, actual services. Uh, another thing I need to mention is that if you have an unlimited amount of energy, now you can reverse the e equals mc squared equation. Because now you can turn energy back into matter. You can precip precipitate matter out of the vacuum. This means that the replicator technology that we see in Star Trek is possible. There are people working on this right now. These are quantum replicators, quantum 3D printers. The 3D printers that we see right now are only the beginning. The 3D printers that we're going to have will actually print in atoms. So that means that you'll actually be able to, and the, I predict the first thing that's going to happen is people are going to be filling up their rooms with diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and bricks of gold. It's, it's just human nature, it's going to happen. But after that, and after the economy collapses as a result of that, then we're going to realize that the only thing that's worth value, the only thing that has value is human creativity. We can't duplicate that, we can't replicate it. So this is something that the, our new economy will actually value, is human creativity. Because right now, that's, that doesn't have value. And this is the world that we have.
Is to transform what is. 